Hello? Okay. Recording on that. Okay, Dad, why don't you go ahead and tell me the, uh, the story you told me about the pool growing up. Okay. Well, uh, my name is Dan Ward. I grew up in uh, South Alabama, raised on a small farm. But as kids growing up uh, in that part of the world, it's, it's very hot, and we, we would uh, go to the creek, local creeks and rivers to swim in. We got, uh, as soon as one of us teenagers got old enough to get our driver's license, we'd go into town seven miles to swim at the public pool. And uh, we did that for several years, and uh, it was also where there would be more girls, obviously. And uh, we, we, that was uh, a weekend thing, mostly, because we worked during the week and, uh, on the farms, and so usually Sunday afternoon, sometimes uh, Saturday night, we would go into that, that pool in town. So we did that uh, for a number of years. And then I went away to college in 64, I think it was, and uh, uh, came back that fall. I can't remember if it was that fall or the next fall, but anyway, somewhere in the mid-60s, I came back and I said to my, my sister, and by then I had uh, a younger brother, a little brother and a, another sister, I said to them, let's go into town and go to the pool and swim. And... Uh, they told me, well, they closed the pool. I said, I was just shocked. What are you talking about? They closed the pool. Because uh, I had been looking forward to that. And uh, they said, well, they closed it because they didn't want black swimming with whites. Uh, I just, I, I guess that's just the way it was. Well, pools were places where um, communities came together. That was where sort of bonds of childhood were formed. That was where, um, you know, as, as teenagers, people began to sort of, you know, forge love interests. I mean, these were, you know, important social spaces, especially during the long summers uh, in, the, in many parts of the South. In turn, you know, again, you can imagine how that informed the sort of um, fears of white Southerners as they're seeing their whole sort of segregated world begin to sort of collapse. June 19th in Nashville, Tennessee, 1961, at the height of the uh, Freedom Ride, Nashville became the, the staging area for the entire nation. And we had an office on Jefferson Street. And during the lull between the Freedom Ride training and then the H.G. Uh, Hill boycott, Matthew Walker and I were running this, the uh, office along with Diane Nash. And we decided we were bored. So just on a lark, we decided to come and test the wonderful pool here in Centennial Park. We knew we couldn't get in. It's one of the best pools in Tennessee by the public, for public. And it was only 25 cents. So we got 25 cents that day, hot day in June, July. It was it June, July, I've forgotten. We drove over here, took our money, went up to the cashier, and we asked for a ticket to get in, because you know he'd say, she said no. But not only did she say no, she said, I'm gonna call the mayor, and I'm gonna find out what we should do. So the pool manager came out, and talk, we were pretty popular by that time. Our faces were all over every, every paper. They knew who we were. So he called the mayor, and the mayor informed him, and he informed the cashier at the, uh, at the entrance that we couldn't be admitted to the pool, and we knew why. And we needed to go. So we said, no, we're not gonna go. So he said, you know what? We're gonna drain the pool. The manager said that. So Matthew and I just said, let's go check out that. So we walked around here, where well, you see this wall behind me, and we walked around and looked, peered over the fence, and there they were. They were actually draining the pool, draining the pool every single drop of water within three hours was empty, gone. So then they said, you know what? You guys can't go anywhere because the mayor's going to drain every pool. We said, all 23 pools in Nashville? Yes, every pool in Nashville is going to be drained. He did, same day. The reason he gave the press was there were financial issues that day. So no black kids ever swam in this pool. Nobody, nobody ever, again, used it as a pool. They filled it with rocks that next week and uh, it became an art center sometimes after we had left Nashville back in the 60s. I have no idea when they did that. But there's a brochure 
that uh, talked about the repurposing of this, of this facility, but it never mentioned the fact that there was a pool closed because of racial issues, never. And public spaces were very important in that. These were these kind of, you know, these hallmarks of white privilege. Um, in, a, in a way, sort of public swimming pools became for, you know, the average working class white southerner sort of their own version of a country club. You know, it was a place where they could go and, um, and other people couldn't. Um, and that sort of was you know, something that which, which they invested a lot of, you know, they were deeply invested in you know, psychologically. Um, it was sort of, you know, that these were um, important places where, um, you know, they could ex you know, sort of realize their own sort of advantages um, socially. And that also maybe helps understand why they were so um, quickly abandoned after desegregation. Uh, it, it, it was a way to avoid uh, what they consider confrontations. And so they closed the black pools and the white pools. The problem is they, 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 they want to rewrite history and act like this never happened. This, there's, no, there's no marker out here saying uh, the site of the, of the closing of the first large pool in Tennessee by the Civil Rights Movement. There's no indication that that ever happened. That way they avoid the issue of, uh, of the mayor and the city closing all the pools and having white kids drown because there's no pools that are safe lifeguards that, that, are, that are legitimate swimming places like this, this was. Mm -mm. The day we, they closed the pools, they asked the, the civil, civil rights people in the office to make a comment about that. And uh, all of us said it's a shame that there'd be a lot of white kids drowning in illegal swimming holes, rivers and slake, lakes and, and little swimming holes. And it happened. And we suggested that any kid that get drowned, that their families take their bodies and take it to the mayor's courthouse and put the body on the, on, the, on the steps of the courthouse. That didn't happen, of course. But we were trying to say, you're responsible for the death of white kids who can't swim. And boys are going to learn how to swim somewhere, have fun in the summer. That's what boys do. And that happened. That happened. I like to see a marker. I, I like to see in the, in the history of Nashville, I like to see the school children of Nashville understand what, 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 what struggle is, what, what racism is and not try to deny it. Uh, we get nothing from denying evil. It just comes back on you. And it, there, there, there's no way to eliminate it like they did in South Africa uh, if you don't have a truth and reconciliation, period. And where you can let bygones be bygones and start fresh. That has not happened in the South at all, especially in cities like this city here, where they really want to be cosmopolitan or just as racist as, as any other city in Alabama. I had a friend in New York who needed to go to Jacksonville. He said, would I drive him down there on my way to Mississippi? Well, I knew what that involved. It was a straight shot south and you just make a right turn, 10 and go over to Mississippi. Well, I got to Jacksonville and lo and behold, I'd read up on St. Augustine and all that. And I said, well, I'm gonna go down there and look at that. I'm right here. You go down there in a the New Jersey Volvo, you get arrested right away for willful, wanton, and reckless driving. And that's how I got started in St. Augustine. Well, you know, I, I was in Albany, Georgia and, uh, that summer. <clears throat> and a guy named Don Harris from SNCC, we just got out of jail. I had from trying to get in the swimming pool in Albany, and they wouldn't let us in, so they locked us up. So I spent five days in jail there. And, and Reverend Wells, who was one of the leaders of the Albany movement, um, and Jose Williams had sent out a call for some of us from Albany to come down to St. Augustine. So we did, we went down there and got involved. Well, we'd been in St. Augustine for a week or so. And the demonstrations, I think, had kind of, they, you know, we marched morning, noon, and night, St. Augustine. And, and, and every time we marched, we got beat up most times. So that was something, Jose, we talked about and wanted to do different. So we had a meeting at this church that he was talking about. He asked that, well, why don't we try, Dr. King and Dr. Avenant had tried to go and have coffee at the Monson Motor Lodge, and they refused them, wouldn't let them in. So we thought that well, maybe we could do something different and, and have a wade in or swim in or something, and Alango was going to be a part of it. 
uh, that he would be in the hotel, and, and so we used to be his guests in a sense, but we couldn't get, go in the front door. Put on our swimsuits and went out to the pool, and lo and behold, there was a camera over there, and there was a camera over there, and a camera there, a camera there, covering what was going to go on in that pool. We were expecting whomsoever to drive up, jump the fence, and get in the pool with us. Turned out it was J.T. Johnson and four high school students whose parents had let them come from Albany, Georgia, to St. Augustine to do some stunts like this. So what we did was come down the side of the street and jumped out of the car and over in the pool. And Al was already in the pool. So at that point, they, uh, the manager didn't like that, uh, Mr. Brock. So he got his pole and started trying to punch us out. And that didn't work, so he got his acid and put it in there. He started pouring that acid all over the pool. I think a lot of folks got us scared about it, but I didn't, it didn't really bother me that much. There was a lot of water, I know that, that acid, Maybe I, my mind told me that it wouldn't do nothing to me. We just sort of enjoyed his difficulty. But then people who'd been up front, Martin and Ralph and others, came around that pool. There was a fence. And I can remember Martin King laughing and laughing and laughing at us uh, because we were beginning to get, really get the goat of the people of St. Augustine. And um, by the time we wouldn't get out, they put a policeman in khakis to come flying through the air. You've probably seen that picture. And um, that was one of the pictures that upset Lyndon Johnson. A lot of things had happened in St. Augustine, and every time we go to the beach, they was being so. I think Senator McGovern was the one who went into President Johnson's office and asked him had he seen that picture. Did he see the news that evening uh, about this acid being poured on these people in Florida? And it's gone all over the world. First week of July, the Civil Rights Bill was passed. They, they, that ended the filibuster in Washington after this incident. But. Um when they did get us out of the pool, they ranked us around in our swimsuits and put us in a car and took us to jail. And uh, once we got out, the, the story behind it is that I, they got us out of the pool, they jumped in and dragged us out, and, and uh, they locked us up. Well, I went to jail in a bathing suit. So when they put me in jail out of this prison, uh, some people was already in there, Fred Shellersworth, C.T. Vivian, and uh, Reverend Wells, a bunch of people was in jail. So when I got in, it was about, Time for dinner, I guess. And they wouldn't feed me. So we just said anything about it. I'm still in my bathing suit. So the next morning they said the same thing. They wouldn't feed me because I didn't have one in the clothes. I said, well, this is where you locked me up. I didn't have any when I got here. So we decided after that we were going on strike. But amazingly, we stayed on strike for about four or five days. But one night that we heard all this, these gates being opened and we couldn't figure out what was going on. So when we looked at it, that the Ku Klux Klan had decided they was coming in to get us, and Reverend Wells, he walked to the front of the jail where the doors was open, and he stood and watched these guys and looked them straight in the eyes. He never said a word. And they all dropped whatever they had and turned around and went back. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. And I knew then that the Lord had taken all the fear out of us, and that was nothing gonna happen to us regardless of what we did. And, and I felt from that moment on very comfortable in the Civil Rights Movement. I, I just didn't think nothing was going to happen to me. There's so many things happened in St. Augustine that folks didn't know anything about because the news media got beat up down there. Everybody got beat up. They didn't care who you were. If you was a part of what we was doing, if you was trying to promote what we was doing, it, it, they didn't like that. It was, it was, it was, Dr. King referred to it as the bloodiest place we'd ever worked. And it really was. A lot of people got hurt up down there. Get out! Get out! Now! 
There's three numbers I could dial. 911. Okay? Yeah, right. Get out. Little punks. Get that. Would you would you say that things are, are better now after what what you both did? Do you feel that things are better? I think the things are different. I don't know how better they are. But they are different. That was some things done.